Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Aaron Baer. Aaron is the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, and number one Amazon best-selling author of Exponential Theory, The Power of Thinking Big. This book is a culmination of Aaron's experience as a strategic facilitator, where he helped leadership solve problems at over 500 companies in nearly 100 countries and in all 50 states. In his career, he has sold 12 companies, started four accelerators, and three nonprofits. And I'm excited to talk to him about the idea of exponential leadership. So Aaron, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to this conversation for a while, John. Yeah, I'm looking forward to talking about this. This is a subject we haven't covered, so I thought it'd be interesting to talk about the idea of exponential leadership. Before we dive in, though, tell us how you got started working as an entrepreneur and and working in the in the strategy field. Well, if I start my entrepreneurship journey, it started when my my dad took a risk, and when I was 12 years old, and I was very impressionable, and he uh, left his oil company to start a Subway sandwich franchise, which was the early days of Subway sandwiches. They weren't necessarily a turnkey proven, um, but I became a sandwich artist at 12 and <laughs> learned, uh, learned child labor laws and uh, also saw my dad find freedom in his life. And I was like, that's, that's what I want. So from that day on, I really sought the entrepreneurial path and that, that led me really to, to develop some strategies that, that ultimately led me to selling a company called Buzzmouth, which is a digital strategy firm. And I was working with a group called Hyper Island out of uh, Sweden, helping them kind of other digital strategy firms in the world kind of make this transition to a digital world. And uh, during that, I became a facilitator and ultimately led me into the boardrooms of Daimler and Coca-Cola and Belfius Bank, which is the National Bank of Belgium and MNC Saatchi, Australia. So I got to travel a lot and I would take these um, boards and strategic leadership teams kind of into new ecosystems to teach them entrepreneurship and innovation. So I was able to get them to Tel Aviv and Singapore, Shanghai, Copenhagen, you know, Boston, New York, Silicon Valley a lot. And we would just literally work to disrupt their thoughts on mm. what they thought was working in their company by showing them exponential companies that they could not compete with because they were too big, too slow. Um, couldn't make decisions fast enough and had just too much overhead to be able to do what these companies were doing. So in that process, I, you know, started taking notes and uh, ultimately came up with 1200 pages of notes over 15 years of doing that. If you think about it, it was like a 15 year long MBA program that I was in, yeah. um, or a, maybe it was several PhDs. Um, but in those notes, I, I really, you know, were able to hammer out my book, Exponential Theory, during COVID when everything shut down. And I was kind of like, okay, what do I do? Well, within a day, I was writing that book. And within three days, I had an ebook. And three months, I had uh, my first book, Reimagining Innovation. Sold a couple thousand copies. Then I got a New York publisher to take interest. And we renamed it Exponential Theory, The Power of Thinking Big, with this idea that, um, and what exponential theory really is, is when you think bigger, you become more conscious. And you become start making decisions for the larger ecosystem, and it ultimately will change your leadership where a lot of leaders are in this mindset of maintaining versus, you know, sustaining or even thriving or growing. And um, you see the difference. And that was the difference that when I would bring these, you know, very large CEOs in, they had a different mindset than the ones that were growing very fast. Um, but they could learn something from each other. And that's what I, you know, basically captured in exponential theory. What, what did you learn about leaders when you worked all these companies? And you said something that I think is really interesting. You said a lot of leaders are just trying to maintain. They, 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 they have achieved some level of success, right? And they want to hold on to that. Uh, and so that creates certain natural characteristics when you're like that. But and you're trying to say, you know, you've got to be thinking differently. So what are some things about leaders that you observed during that time? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the biggest thing about maintaining is the fact that is uh, not making a decision is making a decision. And yeah. in today's world, in today's exponential world, I mean, it's much better to make a decision, make a mistake and learn from it than to be paralyzed by decisions. And um, that's probably the biggest transfer of, of wisdom. I won't call it knowledge that you see from leaders that are, are really exponential thinking versus ones that are maintained. And I think people that get to a certain level they become uh, really immune to making decisions. And that's where you see these companies, you're like, wow, like 
you know, they see the they see the iceberg. Um, you know, no no pun intended to kind of your background is they they just aren't willing to kind of make the adjustments to not hit the iceberg. Um, and it's it's they'll have conversations about it. They'll know the strategies of what to do. They'll have the recommendations. I mean, they have all the knowledge, um, but the wisdom is to apply that knowledge to be able to understand that a company has to go through a certain amount of changes. And that's where in the book, I really capture these, these companies that really have changed our landscape and how much they've changed the conversation towards them. And that's these, these companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon, uh, Tesla. I mean, I cover all of them in different chapters of my book and, and how they really came about to making their decisions and how they grew into the powerhouses and really changed our culture, you know, as far as how much, how we spend our time and, you know, how we actually shop and how we spend our money. And, you know, and, and we see this constant disruption and even Elon Musk, you know, making that as far as moving Twitter to X and being a financial platform. You know, it's this idea that if you don't disrupt yourself, you will be disrupted. And that is a certainty because even Apple is reinventing its business model as we speak, even though they have 15% uh, of the money in the S&P 500 and the cash flow, cash in the bank. Um, so it's, it's amazing in companies that how rich they are, but to understand that they got to continually evolve and change to survive, you know, the future. And that's, that's one of the things that, um, it really takes, you know, the ability to kind of have some foresight to make some mistakes, learn from it fast, but continue to grow, to think bigger. Like, and I think that's the part of not making a decision is you have no shot at thinking bigger. If you're just willing to kind of sit with the decisions you made and honestly, then that trickles down into the organization. And now the rest of your organization is paralyzed to make decisions because um, they don't, they're not really rewarded for that. And that's where we, we see, you know, a whole, um, a whole ship of people running the Titanic um, right into an iceberg, even though they know they're going to do that um, because it's almost certain you can look at certain companies and like have conversations and they all knew it when it was happening, could make decisions, didn't. Um, and that's also, they're just trying to personally and professionally hold on to what they have. So yeah. it's often easier that their board won't be as infuriated if they don't make mistakes, but that's where the tenure of, you know, chief marketing officers and, you know, CEOs are just continually shrinking because it's easier to blame someone than actually to kind of weather a storm, which is a unfortunate part of society today is we're all about instant gratification where in the book, I really covered these leaders that are exponential they're about deferred gratification. And I think it's a big leadership shift where when you think longer term and Bill, I have a quote in the book from Bill Gates is most people often overestimate what they can do in one year, but they always underestimate what they can do in 10. Yeah. And I think it's a, it's a key to leadership is, and, and it is in politics. I mean, we could talk about all kinds of different subjects that are kind of spurred by this, but when you're only, you know, you got your blinders on, you're only thinking about you know, next three months or next, you know, next cycle, or next two years or the, this year's annual report, um, you're not going to make the right decisions for the company in the long run and the company's health and long being and well being. And, you know, just like um, us as humans, um, we often make the wrong decisions if we're just thinking about today. Um, but we'll make a lot better decisions if we can really think about the future that we're living into and the consequences of our actions. So, it's, you know, it's very relevant to the environment, to our own longevity, to, you know, the leadership of a company, which are three topics I really have dug deep. And my next book kind of intertwines those into one mindset to understand that exponential thinking, you know, is part of, you know, the success model for Earth as a planet, <laughs> um, you know, with exponential technologies and how they apply and how they can change our course. But it's also the longevity of each individual, you know, and how they think about their own lives. And then, you know, as your company and you apply that to a company, it, it really is, you know, when you start thinking longer term, making those decisions and understand you may have to, you may not get to your long term vision, but you have to put it out there so that people can understand it, find clarity, and then ultimately find agility. And this is this model, this VUCA model that I include in my book um, that really came from, a, you know, really the generals in Afghanistan. I really created a new acronym around vision, understanding, clarity, and agility um, really is the path forward for many, many companies is to kind of figure out what that is and be understand that you're going to have to make, you're going to have to make changes to that, but you're going to have to move towards some massive transformative purpose if you're wanting to stay afloat at all. It's interesting because I'm, I'm 56 years old and I've seen 
the companies that have existed my whole life disappearing now, you know, and it's, it's wild to watch it. And, um, you know, and one of the things that, you know, I'm, 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 you know, being older, my MBA, I had a, got a long time ago, but I remember in my MBA program, we were talking and writing projects about Blockbuster and how great they were doing and all the things they could go into and their, their potential future. And to see them just completely disappear off the earth, right? Because of really a, a technology change and a shift that they didn't didn't see coming, they didn't uh, prepare themselves for. I mean, it's a it's a classic example of a company that didn't think about the future enough. They were they were so successful in what they had built that they didn't see you know Netflix coming around and just eating their lunch with this online model and. And uh, it's really interesting. And, and so, you know, kind of the question I was going to ask you is, you know, how do we build leadership in a big company or even in a small company where there's somebody in, on the team that's going to be talking about the future? Because I think what ends up happening, you're right, is we get paid for results and in, in, in today and this month and this quarter and this year. But you almost have to have like someone on the team that's going to go, but what about this? Like a devil's advocate there, or someone that's going to challenge the status quo and saying, hey, guys, this is coming out. How do how do you how does a leadership team build that into their structure so that they don't get lulled into the day to day and the month to month and the quarter to quarter? But they actually think, holy cow, if we don't move in this direction, we're toast. I mean, because Blockbuster was extremely successful and then it was gone. It's incredible uh, what happened to them. Yeah, I mean, and, and I blockbusters in in the book, as you know, and yeah. uh, an exponential theory, and it it's a good story of, um, you know, really ego and complacency, and I and I think when you're on top, it's it's very easy to rest on being on top, but just understand that everyone in the world is shooting for you. And today, what is certain is that technology is going to disrupt whatever it is and, and continually disrupt whatever technology. I mean, no technology that was, you know, cutting edge 10 years ago is cutting edge today. And some of them have been to place. Some of them have kind of fought it off for maybe a little, little time period. But that speed is happening faster and faster. So I think I'm actually in the process of creating something called the Change Agents Academy. And we're enrolling 50 to 100 people a week in this. And it's this idea of a change agent mindset and it's what companies need and build into that as a model of foresight is to think about what are all the different scenarios? How do you apply, you know, in, in my book, I talk about these exponential technologies. There's 38 of them currently come to market right now and they're going to disrupt every industry. And if I always play this game when I go into the boardroom or strategic leadership team, where we, we start to like kind of be innovators and I'm like, well, you know, you're all innovators and people, well, I'm not an innovator. And mm -hmm. so then we start talking about these technologies and I start saying, okay, let's, let's add the opinion AI together. What does that start to create? You know, and then you add robotics in that. And then all of a sudden you could shift and then apply it to an industry, you know, like laundry mats. And <laughs> I always, always find really uninteresting models and you realize, oh, wow, technology is going to disrupt the laundry mat. And it's, it's already happening because that's geography based like a blockbuster um, now it's going to be, you know, something that the laundry hits, you know, you gets out of your closet, <laughs> gets put back in your closet, you know, you get drones, robots. I mean, there's all these different things that could totally disrupt the industry and, you know, really raise a significant amount of money to disrupt a pretty boring industry. But if you get people in a room and you start thinking about all the different technologies, processes, how things, business models that come to market that are just better than what theirs is. And the reality is, is most of these old business models, and as you said, these companies that are just disappearing that have been there forever, they don't completely reinvent themselves. And that's why you see Walmart um, really working hard to completely reinvent who they are. And they may make it, they may not. But what they have done is significantly understand they have to disrupt themselves. They've had a few false starts. I don't actually talk about this in my book, but I've done a lot of research on it, you know, before it was like the people that ran all the stores that had all the revenue had all the power. You need to think yeah. about a power structure of leadership. Like, well, yeah. you know, I run a $500 billion business. What do I care about a little e-commerce site? And that becomes the attitude that everything comes up to them is like, okay, we don't want to tell them this little company, Amazon's kind of can't eat steam and potentially could be a threat to us. But ultimately what 
what happened is Walmart's like, well, let's create our own. But then they had it reporting into the people that had all the revenue from the retail locations. And then as it gained momentum, they saw it as a threat. So literally it got shut down twice. And on the third time, eventually they said, okay, the board said, we're going to separate this out from our retail yeah. and build this outside of it, which is where innovation happens. It doesn't, the bureaucracy will always eat leaders themselves, even though, and this is the unfortunate part of leadership. And I think you've seen this probably on a lot of your podcasts and, you know, different leaders you talk is leaders are, self-defeating purpose when they think about themselves over the company yeah. and then when they think about the short term or the long term so yes. if you can change those two variables you now have leaders that think long term and think about the company over themselves then sometimes they're the pawn in this and that's the hero that lives on versus you know the one that um you know basically takes the ship down because they're wanting to keep things the way it is and they're you know wanting to hit their next you know quarter's earnings um versus retraining the marketplace to say you know hitting earnings isn't as important as growing this business which is what jeff bezos did at amazon and for 19 years never hit a quarter and then all of a sudden you know literally became a multi-trillion dollar company um yeah. in the process of thinking more long term and that's how all these companies that's how tesla that's how um google um even Facebook now, um, and, and they're going to take missteps and different things, but they're also going to make the right moves. And that's where we can always sit on the armchair and criticize Mark Zuckerberg for all of his investments in Meta, but someone is going to make that. Maybe it's them, maybe it's not. Maybe it's the time, maybe it's not. It's it's just a matter of continually pushing forward so that you're there and you have enough money that maybe you can acquire the person that does become that, which Candidly, Facebook has done better than anyone acquiring WhatsApp and Instagram and, you know, done some of these things that uh, have really uh, kept them in the game versus, you know, relying on their just their Facebook audience. So anyways, it's just that that mindset is exponential. That kind of if in a way like Blockbuster had the chance to buy Netflix for a million dollars <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. you know, chose not to, which is yeah. just why wouldn't you? I don't know. But um you know, at the time they were worried about Redbox. And I, yeah. I talk a lot about that is, and, you know, Redbox is still alive, but not doing very well. And there is one blockbuster in Bend, Oregon. Still there alive. is, yes. <laughs> so, yeah. And I, yeah. I used to always, when I was on speech to make this story is, and this this would happen less and less now, but I always carried a hundred dollar bill around on me. And does anyone have a blockbuster card? I'll give you a hundred bucks for it. Ah. I, I was collecting blockbuster cards and you know, I lately, I have one. lately, I haven't found many. They they found their way out of people's walls. Yeah, yeah, they have. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm in um, I'm in rural Maine right now. I'm kind of working remote this summer, and um, I have found red box stores. <laughs> so when you're in the, we're in the rural, you know, the country, you you, you find them. So yeah. yeah, yeah, they're still there. Yeah, they're still there. So, um, what if you were to say, um, you know, describe what exponential leadership is or what are some characteristics of exponential leadership what would they be yeah I, th I think there's a model i mean it's this idea of a growth mindset is um you know a lot of leaders that are just want to maintain and, and and i've talked about this before and in my book is you know if you're you're just spending 10 percent or less on your marketing you're probably looking just to maintain or, or create a linear growth um if you want to grow a little bit more, you know, it's, it's not only just percentage, but it's like, what's the impact of that money. Um, but if you get up in the hyper growth of 30% plus of your money in marketing, you'll, you'll start to find new strategies of growth and it creates a growth mindset within the company. So where you're, where you spend your revenue or where you budget is where your company will go. And, you know, those CEOs that come in and want to do all the cost cutting and everything they're they're in a maintained doom or die situation. I think that's a changing strategy, but there's just too much disruption in all these different markets and too much competitors coming from outside their industry to, you know, say, hey, we'll compete by, you know, creating better margins. Um, you know, there's certain industries that probably still can do that, but not many. And they're they're slowly, slowly slipping away. So part of it is just like the vision and strategy of where do you want to go? How do you want to grow? And I'm not always at growth for growth's sake. I don't think that's important at certain size of companies, but it's to be aware that you may have to disrupt your current business model that is maybe bringing up 
90% of your revenue, yeah. you may start to see that that revenue is going to disappear. Those margins are going to disappear. The business model is going to be defunct. And when you see that, then you have to, you know, really shift your vision to say, how do I transition my people that may not have the skills for the future? Yeah. Uh, you know, and that's, that's, you know, when I'm in global car companies, when I'm in their boardroom, you know, that's the conversation is like, well, you know, we're great at building combustion engines. We're not that good at growing EV, you know, electric vehicles. So, you know, making that shift is, is pertinent to stay alive because every car company on this planet has made that shift. But as you know, for 20 years, people fought that off and sometimes successfully were able to kill the car, the electric car, um, different oil and, and car companies, you know, in the nineties. So, but now you have this change that, you know, leaders see it, but are they willing to make the decisions to actually transition to that? And it's a tough, those are tougher, tougher decisions to make. And um, regardless, there is a lot of after, aftermath of exponential because, you know, as the, the water comes in, you know, disruption comes in, and, you know, when it comes out, you know, you, you leave a lot of different particles in the, in the, you know, the sands there where, you know, the water came in. So it's figuring out how to, to help leaders, you know, make decisions, make mistakes, iterate towards a better business model. And like I said earlier, the way to possibly do that is to disrupt it by creating the innovation outside and then bringing it in as it grows, as it gains speed. And you may want to take a few different experiments to do that. And as I work with a lot of different, you know, multi-billion dollar companies, as well as startups, the multi-billion dollar, I'm just helping them innovate from the outside and then figuring out how do they make their big bets to kind of reinvent their business model to be a business model of the future, which, and leveraging the skills. And it's thinking, what do you have that no one else has? And that's, you know, really taking assessment is, okay, we have all this, we have this sales force that's incredible. Well, okay, well, what could they sell also into the channels that you have that could disrupt your business model, you know? And so it's asking those questions and, and thinking through the leadership is, you know, the future is not actually that foggy. I think, you know, we, we as human beings actually know where this is going. I mean, we get surprised every once in a while um, by something like Alexa or, you know, some technology that comes in and invades everything and changes up, you know, the trajectory of different, you know, emerging technologies. But as you lay out the 38 emerging technologies, yeah, there's some new emerging technologies that are going to probably be added to that list. But all you have to look at is now is when is that change going to happen? It is going to happen. And it's going to happen to all of us and every industry and every person, small business and large, is going to have to make that transition. The beauty of it is if you get your business model between here and the future, and that's what I attempt to do is say, okay, look at you know this idea of singularity, which is a hard thing for people to wrap around their head around. But I I taught for a year and lived at NASA Ames on in Mountain View and, and really in Silicon Valley at Singularity University. And their concept of Singularity University is this idea that you know, someday there's going to be this super technology that kind of supersedes it's AI, you know, it's robotic, it's all these things kind of merging in the future. Well, if you take every industry and what I like to do is play this game is from where we are right now, wherever your technology is to where that is, we may never get there. And I think this is the point of exponential leadership is kind of paint a picture that maybe be a little sci-fi, um, like colonizing Mars, you know, does Elon Musk really think he's going to colonize Mars? I, I think he has a shot, but now he's built renewable rockets and he's shuttling, you know, astronauts back and forth to the space station and his largest private space company. So on his way there, that big idea attracted the talent into that. So to take that analogy into any company is what are the technologies that are likely to disrupt you? And it becomes very clear, very, very quickly um, of the different technologies that are going to disrupt you the quickest and ones that are going to take a little longer. And like I said, you might get surprised every once in a while, but we're not talking that way because we're so focused on instant gratification. And we're talking about hitting our earnings and running a business and maintaining it. So that really kills exponential leadership when you have leaders that are so worried about today, which you have to have a highly effective organization running to then lead your focus to say, how do I disrupt that? And that is um, a duality yeah. that very few leaders have. And you know, I'll be honest, you know, you can look at the S&P 500 and the life cycle of S&P 500 companies. It's shrinking because they get acquired faster, but it's also shrinking because companies are dying. 
And mm -hmm. I talk about a graveyard of companies that have died that literally led innovation, <laughs> you know, like Kodak and the digital camera, mm -hmm. but only to be to the demise that it actually killed them. And they didn't really ever transition to a business model that they absolutely owned all the IP in, um, but watched it uh, just dismantle their business one by one because the exec executives in the film business and the photo business is like, this is too good. Why would we ever go away from this? Well, the rest of the world caught up and sooner or later that film business is all but shrunk and disappeared. And now it's just kind of highly commercialized commercial business that is run outside of Kodak that was sold off in the bankruptcy. So it just, it's, you know, whether you're willing to, to, to bite the bullet now or later, later is going to be a lot, lot worse for us. Um, mm -hmm. than if, if you don't make that decision now. And I think that's where my goal as a facilitator is to go into boardrooms and leadership teams and have that conversation because it'll, it'll ultimately change their mindset to say, okay, how, how do we become change agents, which is what we're really recruiting is I think the world just needs change agents, people that actually know how to facilitate change. And um, ideally it's asking these questions and it's not difficult. The, you know, my book exponential theory kind of maps out a lot of it. Um, my next book is going to be called confessions of a change agent, because <laughs> I really think I failed, I failed my way to becoming a change agent. And I think everyone does. And I think that's the misnomer of success is that, you know, hey, someone had the right pedigree and did the right different things. You know, if they're really going to be a change agent and change something in this world, it's because they failed a lot. It's not because they were successful at a lot of things. And I think that's a key lesson for our leaders is like, let's celebrate failure and learn and learn and grow from it. Um, which right now we we still have companies that believe in the old system that like, well, if you failed, you're out. Um, cancel culture is at its highest now. Yeah. Um, where we need to learn and grow from these things. I mean, at the end of the day, we we will make mistakes. We'll continue to make mistakes, but the greatest innovations are made with mistakes. And yeah, like that's that's where we live at today. You know, I was involved with. Uh, I worked for you know large global company ABB. We were we were you know getting involved with the smart grid launch and what was happening with smart grid. And we were you know we saw the future and we we expected a a, a grid that could self heal that could, you would have, you can be able to put on uh, all these renewable sources at any point in time, bring them on, turn them off, you know, control power usage, power flow. I mean, we had a vision for the future, which was a, a, a smart uh, grid. And we developed all the products and the technology around making it smart. What was interesting is the customers weren't ready for it. We were ahead of the curve. We were ahead of where the customers uh, were willing to pay money for it. And, um, we ended up having pilots all over the country, all well, internationally too, but mostly in the U.S. We had all these smart grid pilots, and we laughed at one point that we had more pilots than than Delta at one point. But uh, and the and the thing is, we but we learned a lot through that process, and we we were way ahead of the curve in terms of what people were willing to to buy. But we learned a lot about the way the technology worked, the way you know some of the keys for the future, uh, how to bring. Uh, uh, customers on board with this new technology. So it wasn't an utter failure, but it it it, we, it certainly wasn't uh it it wasn't a success. It wasn't we didn't achieve any large revenue growth through it, but we learned a lot about you know then when we're we're better we were better ready for the next wave, I guess is yeah. to say. Yeah. John, that's why I think it's a key is to help people transition, understand, like redefine what success is because yeah. We often talk in revenue in terms and you know sales, and I think it's because it's the lifeblood of a company. But it's right. and an exponential leader, you know, and if you look at the companies that all have disrupted the world and now have more revenue and cash than anyone, it's because along the way they taught their analysts and they taught their employees and everybody to say, okay, we're going to have to go through a long, rough period yeah. to get where we want to go. And, and you know, it's like Steve Jobs, obviously creating products not for customers of what they wanted. He was like, "This is what we're going to create the demand for this." And I think you gave a great example of, you know, when you, when we talk about success, is like, how do you redefine success? Is like, learning is success. Yeah, yeah, failure is part of that. And there comes a point where, in that whole transition, and this is what I often have these conversations when I'm facilitating, is like, okay, what are the products though? If if the customers aren't ready for this, what are they ready for? Yeah. And how do we actually fill in those voids? Because 
along the way, and, uh, and I'll just, I'll give you an example is uh, the iPad. Yeah, and I, I briefly talk about this in my book, but, um, you know, Steve Jobs decided to roll out the iPad. Well, he basically, instead of re-engineering a, a phone, which, you know, the iPhone was actually much more sophisticated than the iPad was when it first came out. The iPad 3 had the same technology that the current iPhone had in when the iPad 1 came out. But what he did is stripped it away because he wanted to drive the price point down so that he could get mass adoption and say, this is what people want. At the time, nobody wanted tablets. Mm. It wasn't a, it wasn't a thing. Now, you know, 15 years later, 20 years later, you know, I, uh, laptops are in decline for the first time. You know, TVs are in decline. All these technologies that, you yeah. know, we never thought would ever decline. You know, it's people like saying, like, how do I drive the cost down so much that this becomes preferable for the masses than a laptop? And that's what we've seen with the tablet world because the technology was so far in front of it. He was able to say, well, let me just drive down the cost. Let me give it like what an iPhone was, iPhone one was. And I don't know what year it was, three or four or whatever, maybe five or six. But he literally put that technology into an iPad and then put it in the market as a dumbed down version because he could drive the cost down, the adoption up. But he already had built, and you just got to think about this. He already had three versions of that built. Yeah. And that's where, you know, we're always wondering what, you know, the market, the great marketing engine of Apple is because they've always had it built before and they're always fine tuning it and then they're rolling it out in perfection. Now, long story short, Samsung and Android and Google and all those caught up and actually further succeeded in them. And that's where I always tell people, you know, seven out of eight smartphones in the world are not iPhones. Um, they're, they're mostly on Android as far as smartphones go. But um, as far as a product, cash flow, marketing, sit ecosystem, system, you know, Apple kind of learned the best that that early adoption rate, because they drove those costs down, got people hooked into their product. And today yeah. it's, it's why they have so much cash, but they were thinking long-term on that. They weren't thinking short-term. They were, you know, they very much could have, you know, came out with the best technology and made bigger profit margins and higher market products. But they were like, you know, we get people hooked into our ecosystems, which is me. Like I've, I've attempted to go to Google at times and, you know, with my, you know, my MacBook pro and my iPhone and my iPad and my Apple watch. And like, you can't just leave and leave all those other products, you know, stranded out there with the one product. So it's a, yeah. it's an interesting longer term strategy. Now they're, they're reinventing that again. And we'll see how they do. You know, I don't, you know, there's always missteps as Google glasses and, you know, their new augmented headset. Yeah. Um, but they're pushing that technology forward. It's, it's absolutely unbelievable what technology that, that those companies are sitting on and things that I've seen that you're just like, okay, the future's here now. And that's where you can start to paint the picture of well, what kind of technologies that our company have to leverage to make sure that we're part of the future. And we're not obsolete because, you know, we're still trying to market on Friendster or MySpace. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Right. Well, this is, this has been fascinating, Aaron. I really do appreciate the, the, your, your perspective on this and you've got us to think differently about this. Um, what are you currently working on now? Yeah. So as I, as I mentioned, I'm creating something called the change agents Academy and basically out of this research, it's kind of created my new book confessions of a change agent, um, which is the working title right now. Um, but we've created the Change Agent Academy, which is a course that's a seven-week course that people go through to help create this change agent mindset. We talk about your thoughts, you know, and it, it really starts to kind of unwire and unlearn, you know, things that maybe don't serve us well. So about your thoughts, and then it goes into habits, you know, how do you actually define the habits that'll get you to the purpose you want to create? We use the Ikigai model, which is a Japanese purpose project that we work on. Then we go to rewrite your story. You know, what's your story of your past? You know, there's probably some things in your past that if we can rewrite a better story of it, then we rewrite, then we write the story of the future is like what now you figured out your purpose. And so how do we actually leverage and use maybe some of the disappointments of the past as fuel for the future? And how do we connect some of these things that have happened to us that may have been failures when we write them? Okay, this is why I needed to learn this. And then, then I get people to really focus on the biggest obstacles can possibly focus on and i always say is if you get mad 
driving in a, you know, in rush hour traffic, uh, you're probably not going to solve world problems. <laughs> so it's like thinking is like, how can I grow the problems I focus on and think bigger? And that's really the learning section of the Change Agents Academy. And then it, it really goes into this growth around the growth mindset. And it's, you know, the goal is not the end. And then being present, being mindful, getting into flow and facilitating. And then the last step is really around managing your energy in every room or every conversation you go into. Um, with the goal that hopefully this is slightly insightful to what you know I see I've seen over and over again is flawed leadership at at really big companies and small companies. Um, and then you know there is a model to help people kind of grow their own thoughts personally, professionally, and organizationally. And that's what I really have instilled in the Change Agents Academy that I'm I'm excited to share with the world. Now that's fantastic. So um, how can our listeners find out more about you, uh, your your book, which is called Exponential Theory, and the Change Agents Academy? Where can they go? Yeah, so Aaron Bear, A-A-R-O-N-B-A-R-E.com. Um, you can learn a lot more about me. From there, you can get to my book, Exponential Theory, on Amazon, Power of Thinking Big. Uh, it's been a Wall Street Journal, USA Today, and number one Amazon bestselling. Actually, it was number two overall on uh, Barnes and Noble behind John Grisham for 10 days. Nice, nice. I was really excited about that. Um, and then Change Agents Academy, you can find it um, either through my site, AaronBear.com under Academy, or you can go to directly to ChangeAgentsAcademy.com. Fantastic. We're going to put links in the show notes for those resources. And leaders, as you're listening in here, you've got to be thinking about the future. And, uh, you know, we scr just scratched the surface about the companies that have disappeared because they haven't looked in the future. And in this book, Exponential Theory, Aaron goes through a lot of those stories. We just touched on a few of them, but um, you got to be thinking differently if you want to succeed, not only now, but in the future. And there's a lot of lessons here. I think one of the biggest lessons I heard uh, is this idea of experimentation and failure and learning from that failure and, 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 you know, redefining what success looks like. I think this big, these are big messages uh, that we need to be thinking about in running our companies now and so that we can survive and be in the future and not be, you know, this uh, cautionary tale that a lot of these companies have turned into. And so we don't want to be that. We want to be around uh, for a long time. So we got to be thinking about what's going to disrupt our business. And Aaron's uh, given us a lot to think about. Aaron, thanks for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. I think you, you, got me thinking about a lot of things with my person, my business. And, uh, and I, and I, and I'm sure our listeners are also thinking about their business as well right now. So I appreciate you coming on and giving us this perspective. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And, uh, you know, enjoy listening to all your leaders that you have on your podcast and, uh, looking forward to continue the journey with you. And if there's anything I can do in the future, let me know. Oh, outstanding. I re really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well.